Greetings and welcome back to 303. These are, uh, this is lecture number nine of our uh, series uh, on ACT grammar prep. Uh, we have in our series already covered nouns, pronouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, prepositions, conjunctions, what some people call the parts of speech. Uh, we covered in the last lecture issues about proper sentence structure. And now we turn to another area where students really struggle when they take the ACT. Issues of mechanics, punctuation, capitalization. In each of our earlier lectures, uh, we have had something to say about taking the ACT. Let's continue that by talking about ACT-styled reading. Now, before the last lecture, Ray, uh, we talked about annotating your text test booklet, you know, taking notes in the test booklet, that kind of thing. Let's talk about the type of reading you're expected to do now on the ACT. Often students fail to appreciate that when I say they need to be reading a lot to prepare for the ACT, they think that what I mean is they need to be reading lots of novels, for example, short stories. And while reading novels and short stories can be useful as a way to keep you engaged in prose, this is not what I mean when I talk about reading, okay? I mean, really, two or three things. Let's think about it. I mean, what you're reading, how much of it. That's one thing for sure. But the second, and for me, way more important, is under what types of timed conditions are you reading? Because this is the key to improving your ACT reading score. When I say that the ACT is a three-hour reading test, often students don't fully grasp what I'm saying. The types of reading that you have to do. Technical information especially is something often students never read. Recently, for example, I talked with a high school junior who was complaining about his low score on the science section of the ACT. I asked him, while you were in your year-long chemistry class, did you ever actually read from your textbook? You know, I'm sure it was a sign. Uh, he admitted he did not. <laughs> And he just relied on his teacher's lectures, study guides provided by the teacher. He admitted he was a good memorizer. It's kind of sad, right? Not only must you practice reading informational texts to score well and higher on the ACT, you also must be reading under timed conditions. This is huge. When you kick back, for example, and enjoy reading a good novel, you're doing a much different kind of reading than the work on the ACT. You must be doing timed readings, where you take a passage, force yourself to read it in five minutes, ten minutes, and then answer some silly questions about what you just read. Listen to what I'm about to say. You can do all the prep work you want. You can know all the information that will be on the ACT and still write an average score if you're not practicing timed readings. In my estimation, this is the heart of ACT score improvement. Because if you don't know how to read well, believe me, you're going to struggle. So hear what I'm saying and get to work with it, all right? By the way, I just spoke to a junior student, high school junior student, who wrote a 28 on the ACT, but complained that she hurt her score by having to guess on the last questions on the reading section of the ACT because she ran out of time. Now we're going to, in the final uh, lecture, lecture 10, we're going to talk a little bit about the reading section and the writing section of the ACT as our introductory comments. But this is a big deal. You've got you've to admit this is a serious concern. Speaking of work, since we were there, we're coming to the end of our lectures now on ACT grammar instruction and improvement. Uh, we turn to the rules, many of them of course silly, right, uh, that have to do with mechanics, punctuation, capitalization. Once again, I'm going to admonish you not to worry so much about why these are the rules they are, but rather learn how to use these rules so that you're ready for the ACT. Ironically, what we're about to study is the stuff most often feared by students as they get ready to take the ACT. And to me, that's silly. I mean, really silly. We know, we know exactly what kinds of questions are going to get asked on the ACT about this topic. All we have to do is learn the rules and be ready to see the mistakes when the ACT shows them to us. So, let's get focused, take good notes as we work through this information, 
I'll say about this lecture what I've said in earlier lectures with lots of detail. Go slow, hit the rewind button once or twice if you need to. For all you grammarians out there and silly people who want to grow up to be English teachers, sorry, I'm only going to talk about the key mechanics issues that usually end up on the ACT. Of course, there are more rules than these. These are the big ones. All right. The key about punctuation rules is knowing where and when to apply them. Now we're going to address issues in this order of apostrophes, commas, semicolons, colons, question marks, quotation marks, exclamation points, and finally capitalization. So hang on. Let's get to work. Let's start with apostrophes. Take a few good notes, shall we? Apostrophes are used in only three places. First, in contractions. Won't, W-O-N, apostrophe T. It's, I-T, apostrophe S. Where's, W-H-E-R-E, apostrophe S. The apostrophe marks the spot where one or more letters have been omitted. You can also recreate the pronunciation of spoken words by using apostrophes in places of dropped letters. For example, instead of going, it's going, G-O-I-N apostrophe, ma'am, M-A apostrophe, ma'am, I-M, uh, singing, S-I-N-G-I-N apostrophe. Apostrophes are used in plurals of letters, signs, numbers, as in A, A's, a apostrophe S, B's, B apostrophe S, or the 1980's 1980 apostrophe S, but I should point out that this is starting to change in some style books, and they actually no longer require the apostrophe. You can actually write it simply as 1980S for 1980s. Finally, apostrophes are used in possessive nouns. The student's class, student apostrophe S class, women's room, W O. M-E-N apostrophe S room. Also in indefinite pronouns, right? Anybody's guess as in anybody apostrophe S guess. When the noun is plural and ends in S, put the apostrophe after the S as in leaves apostrophe color or horses apostrophe stable. In a series of nouns showing joint possession, the last noun receives the apostrophe, as in Susan and George's, with George apostrophe S, house. Now, if Susan and George had separate houses, right, the phrase would read Susan's as apostrophe S and George, George's apostrophe S, houses. A few possessive forms use both an apostrophe and of, as in a friend of the families, where F A M I. F-A-M-I-L-Y apostrophe S. All right. A few others that specify time, space, value, quantity also require apostrophes, as in an hour's time, H-O-U-R apostrophe S, a dollar's worth, dollar apostrophe S, at my wit's end, wit apostrophe S. Question, though, how about this one? What about Mother's Day? Is it M-O-T-H-E-R apostrophe S day? Or is it M-O-T-H-E-R-S apostrophe day? Well, you can actually Google this for some fun. It's just like Father's Day as well. It's actually M-O-T-H-E-R apostrophe S day in the version used in the law, which made Mother's Day official. If you want to Google this, you can see it for yourself. But you'll often see it spelled as M-O-T-H-E-R-S apostrophe day. What you'll want to look for on the ACT are usually mistakes made in any one of these three areas. A key is, if you're annotating your test book and you see an apostrophe, I always recommend that you just circle it right away and immediately identify if there's a mistake. It's easy to do if and only if what? Right, you know the rules, right? For example, if you read on the ACT, the leaves L-E-A-V-E -E apostrophe S colors are turning. You circle the apostrophe and ask, is that right? And you know that nouns that end with S receive the apostrophe after the final S, and you have the correct answer right away. When you are in an ACT testing environment, listen to this, when you are in an ACT testing environment and this happens to you, where you immediately identify, oh, dude, I know exactly the rule, it's been broken, I immediately identify that I have found a mistake and you know how to fix that mistake, 
That's where confidence and enthusiasm come from when you are taking the ACT. Let's turn next to comms. This is a huge one on the ACT. It seems more students miss these questions. They're not always sure, which is silly, because the rules are actually very simple. So let's take a few notes. Of course, the irony is that the comma is meant to prevent confusion and misunderstanding, right? Ha! Ah. Commas basically do a few things. Let's, let's get it in our notes. They divide sentences into parts. They clarify meaning by separating groups of words into discrete units. Often, they will signal a pause that helps readers understand text. Sometimes a comma is optional. When given the choice, leave it out, unless using it makes things more clear. Let's outline each of these in some detail, shall we? First, you use a comma to signal a pause. Listen to this, these two sentences to get a sense of it. Here is the sentence without a pause. After brushing, his teeth gleamed. What? Hear it with the pause and the comma. After brushing, comma, his teeth gleamed. See how it makes more sense? You use a comma after some introductory words and in various forms of address. For example, well, comma, you can open it whenever it's convenient. Another example. The letter will be waiting for you at home, comma, steep. You use commas to set off words that interrupt the flow of a sentence. Commas are required when conjunctive adverbs are inserted between the subject and the verb. For example, David, comma, regrettably, comma, was omitted from the roster. Another example, Jim, comma, on the other hand, comma, was included. You use a comma when a subordinate clause containing information not essential to the main clause is embedded in the main clause. For example, the lost hiker, comma, who had come from Texas, comma, found shelter in a cave. Commas are needed to set off a positives, phrases that describe nouns or pronouns. For example, Kevin Smith, comma, the school principal, comma, walked into the office. However, single word appositives don't require commas, although there's no harm in putting them in. For example, my brother John lives in Texas can be written without a comma, or my brother, comma, John, comma, lives in Texas. Either way is acceptable. The comma is often needed to separate the independent clauses of a compound sentence. For example, the competition is stiff, comma, but it won't keep John from winning. If the clauses are short, omit the comma. For example, John ate a snack and he left. No need for a comma here. Let's comment on the use of the word however. If you are starting a sentence with the word however, use the comma after the word. If you are using the word however to build a compound sentence, you use the semicolon and then a comma after the word however. Let me give you an example. The Warriors played hard, semicolon. However, comma, they lost the game. Sorry. You want to use commas in a series. For example, Joe's truck needs new tires, comma, a battery, comma, a muffler, comma, and an oil change. Some like to skip that comma before the last item in a series, but just in case clarity may suffer, it can't hurt to put it in. This is called the Oxford comma or the serial comma and there are actually people who get in fights over whether to use it or not. You can Google this for yourself to see what I mean. It's kind of a joke. Commas separate parts of addresses, dates, place names. Now this is silly stuff you just have to memorize. Learn it so you can do it on the ACT and then you can forget it after you take the test if you like, right? For example, who lives at 666 West 15th Street, comma, Casper, comma, Wyoming. Another example. Joe, uh, Joe was born on August 25, comma, 1962, comma, the same day as Kim. This example. Dave has lived in Madison, comma, Wisconsin, semicolon, Seattle, comma, Washington, semicolon, and Eugene, comma, Oregon. By the way, note that because each item in the last example already contains a comma, semicolons are needed to avoid confusion, right? When writing dialogue, use comma 
commas to separate quotations from the attributions. For example, Steve said, comma, quotation marks, shut the window in quotation marks. How about this one? Quotation mark, I want it open, comma, quotation mark, shouted Dave. There you go. Those are the comma rules. Go back over them, go online, find some grammar exercises to help you to understand, practice, may be the difference between an average ACT score and a high ACT score. We just mentioned semicolons above. Let's study the rules for those now, okay? We use semicolons when we have written two sentences that are so closely tied to each other that separating them would diminish somehow their integrity. The semicolon shortens the pause that ordinarily occurs at the juncture of two separate sentences. For example, Jill never stays out late, semicolon. Her mother is always worrying about. One word of caution. Semicolons are not substitutes for periods. I'm sorry. Semicolons are substitutes for periods, not commas. Okay? You use semicolons only to separate independent clauses in this way. All right? Hear it and see it wrong. On the test, Chill got a 90 semicolon, which raised her final average. Okay? That's wrong. We don't need it. The clause which raised her final average is not an independent clause. To rewrite it and use the semicolon, do it this way. On the test, Jill got a 90, semicolon. This grade raised her final average. Just to remind, if you put a comma where you have the semicolon, this is a comma splice, naughty naughty, right? Also, just to remind, when you use however, after a semicolon, the comma follows the word however. Use semicolons to avoid confusion in a series in which one or more items contains a comma. For example, on his trek, comma, Joe met Joe, comma, a carpenter from Maine, semicolon, Dr. Jones, comma, a pediatrician from St. Louis, semicolon, Jonathan, comma, an airline pilot, semicolon, and me, comma, of course, okay? Let's focus on colons for a second. By the way, you want to Google the etymology or the origin, the word origin of the word colon. That's kind of some fun, too. A colon calls attention to the words that follow it. It's useful to introduce a list, add in a positive, or in certain contexts, introduce a quotation. For example, in his homework, Joe referenced at least three different kinds of texts, colon, a poem, an essay, and a play. How about this example? Think about the irony when Polonius says, colon, above all, to thine own self be true. You want to use a colon between two sentences if the second sentence explains or summarizes the first. Although no rule says that you must capitalize the second sentence, many writers prefer to do so. For example, <clears throat> my gym class feels like outer space, colon, it goes on forever, and the I in the word it capitalized. It's a mistake to use a colon after an incomplete sentence. <clears throat> ACT loves to test this, so pay close attention. Hear it wrong. Here's an example where it's wrong. Three common types of hardwood trees are colon, maple, oak, and ash. Again, hear it wrong. Judy's course load consists of colon, English, math, and chemistry. Both of those are wrong. No use of the word colon. The colons here spoil the unity of what would otherwise be perfectly good sentences. Just drop the colon in both these examples. <clears throat> Let's talk about the dash mark for a second, all right? Note how much Emily Dickinson loved the dash mark, as we've sometimes said in our American Lit lectures. Nothing attracts attention as well as a dash, right? Dashes make readers pay attention because they mark an abrupt change in thought. They're used mostly to define or explain a word or an idea. For example, halfway through the speech, he lost sight of his purpose, dash, to inform the audience about risky investments. By using two dashes, you can insert parathetical information or material into a sentence or include a sudden change in thought. For example, the state finally agreed to install a traffic light, double dash. Why did it take them so long, question mark, double dash, at the intersection downtown? <coughs> Excuse me. Single dashes can combine closely related ideas. For example, the state finally agreed to install a traffic light at the intersection, dash, hallelujah. Be aware, by the way, many editors and teachers claim it's not proper to use dashes in formal prose, so do it sparingly. We'll come back to finish here in a second. Thank you.